If you were going to write a story about someone catching a grand slam, I think there's some essential ingredients. They need to be a proper fly angler, someone who knows the value of catching a permit, a tarpon, and a bonefish in the same day. They need to be outfitted to the nines, right? The best gear, the best fly rod, the best fly reels. They need to go to an elite lot to make them deserve a grand slam. They need to be superior to all fly anglers because, again, they know what they're doing to pursue this goal. Well, this is this is not that story. We've talked about this before, but at Dorsal, it's worth repeating. Ever since we were 18, we've done these bootstrapped, embarrassingly low budget trips where we go around and try to catch what, what we can, which kind of led us this year to look at an area of the Yucatan we'd actually overlooked for a long time. from the species that contains the variety of like different locales that this area had, the kind of off the beaten path that we love, like the Yucatan just made sense to us. And so while we were on another year of a tight budget, we were like, yeah, this area of the Yucatan makes a lot of sense for us. So when we were prepping up for our trip to Mexico, just a lot of things like stuck out to us, right? It's from an area that has a strong Mayan influence. So the food is gonna be just very unique, right? We were talking with folks uh, who live there, uh, just about the, you know, the different food types we could get. Um, I mean, just goodness, there's a rich array of fruits, vegetables that we haven't experienced before, um, types of tacos we haven't experienced before. I mean, just like, there was so much about this trip that had nothing to do with fishing that we were so excited about. We love traveling for, to Central America because in most experiences we have, it's like Southern hospitality on steroids. Like this is like for us as a bunch of Alabama guys, this is like coming home, except you know, it's tropical, which is plus. So when we looked at the area, like there's just like, again, so much to take in. The food, the people, the, the idea that there were gonna be, you know, inland lagoons we could fish. There would be these beaches that, that bonefish, tarpon, snook, all just swam down the shoreline. Um, like it's just, there's so much there. We're just really, really excited about going to this area of Mexico. So for once in our lives, we took off from Birmingham, Alabama, took a little stop in Miami, and then jetted our way to the Yucatan. And I gotta admit, like, I was super surprised when nothing went wrong. Like, our vibe is something always going wrong. <laughs> I get to change my underwear. So we arrive in the Yucatan, we get our rental cars, and we strike out, driving across um, again, some, some pretty remote areas of the Yucatan, getting some fresh roadside treats as we go um, before we finally made it to the, the house we had rented for the week. When we started to rig up for this trip, there's just that, that anticipation, right? Like no one's going to sleep the first night. You know that we are there to try to catch as many fish as possible. We're there to have a lot of fun. Um, but there's also if I'm gonna be honest in our team, a little bit of, a, of impending doom, right? Typically these trips start off for us really, really slow. Um, we gotta learn the area, we gotta learn the guides, we gotta learn what we're doing. And just, I mean, luck usually doesn't go our way. And so when we start out for the first day, I'll be honest, I had pretty, pretty low expectations. Um, first day is probably gonna be a lemon. We're gonna learn from it, readjust and go from there. And I honestly would have no idea that the first day would start the way it did. So the first day we 
get up and get ready to go. I'm a big coffee snob, so I was brewing some Mexican coffee on the stove, making some eggs, getting excited about the day. And uh, we had kind of planned out, we were gonna split up the group. So half the group was gonna go south and half the group was gonna go north. And so I was in the north group. And so um, we met up with our guide, Nick Denbo, and he was like, hey, I'm gonna put my John boat into this little lake right by your house. And we're gonna try to get a tarpon on the board. And again, I, I mean, I love tarpon, always have. Hot, hot take here, I love baby tarpon, right? All the jumps with none of the four hour bulldogs or the big boys, again, that makes me less of an angler or whatever, but I love baby tarpon. And my, and my brother David's on the rod because he just recently got into fly fishing. So we're like, look, there's not a better way to break into a fly rod and assault than a tarpon, so get ready. And so me and Kai are in the, in the John boat, and um, sure enough, David starts tangling with a couple tarpon. Looked like a really good sized fish in the patch of glassy water right straight behind that second buoy at 10 o'clock. I'm way, way out of range. He hit again! Yeah! Do you think you hooked him? I have no idea. Survive the next jump and then go for a No, ride. I didn't! Oh. No matter. Um, again, inexperienced, so he uh, pops off a couple of fish, a couple of jumps go the wrong way. So he, he, he goes, dude, this is so much fun, Hand me, hands me the rod and says, now it's your turn. And I was like, can't wait. So we're fishing along and um, sure enough, throw a little dark bug against the, the mangrove shoreline, strip, strip, strip. Tail nip, maybe. He's on it, oh. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna high stick him for you, Dave. Keep, keep the focus on the line. Jump. Oh, oh, is that really? I'm just gonna get one jump out of you. Come on, dude, you're a baby. Give me a little more. A little mountains. Caught one. I oh, know. He had it. That's just in the corner. That's all right. Or is it under his eye? Uh, yeah, it kind of rotated around in his mouth. Actually, looks like it's in the in the in the corner of the maxillary, maybe. Yeah, from the outside. So right. swipe them. <laughs> Still counts. Little baby tarpon. Again, it, and I, the way I like thinking about this as an Alabama guy, it would be a good bass, and it, tarpon fight harder than bass. So this is great. And so it's, I mean, it's a tiny tarpon, but I catch a tarpon, release it, and uh, I'm on the board. And so next up is Kai. And so we keep on fishing this little lake and, and, and are kind of wrangling a free, few baby tarpon here and there. And then basically we fish the entire shoreline. And so Nick goes, all right, guys, um, let's let's load up the John boat, get out of here, and let's go hit the beach. I'm a trashy angler, so like, you know, when I'm at the beach with family, I love catching ladyfish on the fly. So he's about to take us to a beach where there's bonefish and permit. Like, I, I'm great. <laughs> I'm excited. So we hit the beaches and um, it's a little bit of a slow start. So they have a lot of stuff there called sargasso grass. And so this is the, the floating seaweed that is kind of this tan color and it creates these big mats uh, on the shoreline. Um, and right now in the Yucatan, they're getting a lot of the stuff. It kind of covers a lot of the shoreline. Um, but so we start fishing around this because basically um, the red water, so where the, the, sh the sargasso grass rots, kind of pushes fish away, but it also includes a lot of nutrients. So the edge lines of sargasso is really, really good for fishing. And so we start fishing the, the beach and um, I throw in a couple bonefish. And two more, two more. Oh, really good one. Oh. Big cut. Pop, pop. Oh, over the grass. Fish, and it's weird. The bonefish don't want to play. And you're, we're on a, like a deserted beach. Like there, there's like, why would a bonefish not want to play? Like it's, they haven't seen a fly in probably months, if not longer. Like this should be like kind of a shoe in, right? Just nothing. We change flies, don't want to play. And um, so we walk on down about a mile down to an, another sandy point. And Nick's like, hey, this is a pretty good area for permit. We've got good clean water, a lot of oxygen in the water. This might be a place where we'll see some permit. 
like, like I want to admit, like the the idea of catching a permit has always intrigued me, but I've never cared enough. Yeah, that's a, that's a hard word. Cared enough to uh, to go after permit because I've just heard about how difficult they are to catch, and I just don't have a lot of time off. Like if I'm taking time away from family and work, like I want to catch fish that want to play, not fish that are mean. <laughs> so sure enough. We're on this beach and we see all these blackbacks, these little slivers of permit that are riding the surf, looking for floating crabs, shrimp, and things like that. And so we start to throw at them and, and the fish would come by, you'd throw at them. I mean, there was times where the fish would hide kind of in the clean water in the edge of the Sargasso and then sneak out right in front of your feet and go, oh, crap. Well, that was a permit, right? They would literally come within three feet of you. It, it was insane. So we're fishing this part of the surf and sure enough, there's permit coming in and in and in. And we just start throwing at them. And these beachside permit typically, from what we hear, you just throw shrimp patterns and see if they're aggressive enough to eat. Like we're throwing at fish, they don't eat. We're throwing at fish, they don't eat. And so um, I started getting pretty frustrated, right? Like we, we caught fish in the morning, getting to lower in the afternoon, and, and it's just not happening. And so I have these two fish that come in and one's a pretty good 20 pound fish, the other one's way smaller. And they come in, they're kind of surfing, and I make a good throw to the first one, and he's and he's just like, no, no, I, I don't want this. So I make another presentation, let it drip, drift a little lower, and then retrieve it back slowly. Again, he's like, dude, I don't want this. So I get frustrated and I throw it again as they kind of go away. And again, this is bad etiquette. This is bad etiquette, but I just throw it on their backs and, you know, kind of dejectedly put my head down and the smaller one turns around and gives chase. And so I was like, oh crap. So I strip back and sure enough, this little one rides awake and gobbles my shrimp pattern. So it hooks up and like, I start screaming. Nick runs down the beach. He's like, you've got a permit, you've got a permit. I was like, ah, what do I do now? And, and in my head, like typically bonefish, they do three runs. They go one long, one medium, one short, and you land them. Permit don't do that. They just run and then they stop and then they run again and it could be even longer. Run and, and then that's that. I mean, it's it's super random. Um, and so I'll fight it, fight it, fight it. And again, it's a little guy. Uh, some of the other guys might have called it a pompano. That's fine. Uh, it was a small, it was a small permit, but I landed it and so I had my first permit on the fly. And so that was very, very cool. And so for me, again, as someone who's fly fish since they were 12 years old, you know, this is, you know, like a pretty cool accomplishment. And so I kind of sit back and I'm on the beach and I'm like, it's pretty cool. Like I, I caught my first permit on the fly. And Nick looks at me and he goes, yeah, well, um, you got to get that grand slam now. And it hit me. I had caught a tarpon in the beginning of the day. I had caught a permit at the, you know, close to the end. All I needed was a bonefish. Like, how hard could it be? It turned out it was very hard.
every turn they were like, nah, I don't want what you have, right? The, the, the permit ate better than, than the bonefish did. Missed, missed fish. I mean, nothing, none of them. I would throw six feet ahead. I would throw 10 feet behind. It didn't matter. They didn't want to play. And so, um, yeah, I filled a grand slam on a bonefish in the Yucatan where they're super easy to catch. Apparently I couldn't even, I couldn't even get a, uh, a mudding bonefish. I filled a grand slam on a bonefish. You said they're green? Oh, I see. So the next morning we got up and um, we decided to try something different. I mean, again, I'm not the kind of guy that's going to hold on to that failed grand slam and be like, let's repeat and repeat until it breaks my way. It's just, it's just not, again, I'm, I'm there to have a good time fishing. And so our guide Nick says, hey, I want to take y'all out, stock us up for a great beachside lunch and we're going to get a bunch of carnitas and so we went to this kind of little hole in the wall butcher shop where they make uh, chicharrones and carnitas every morning and so this guy's just chopping it up fresh and I mean goodness I could have eaten all that for breakfast but we make a pile like we get a, like two pounds of carnitas to go and get a slow start to the to the day and um and I'll be honest it kind of like set the tone for the the morning We get to a, a nice little beachside flat. We're not gonna do the John boat thing that morning. And uh, we were just looking for some good beachside bonefish and nothing to be found. We even like uh, drive over to where we saw the permit the day before and no permit round. So we, you know, trying to like figure out what to do and and literally, I'm, I'm not kidding, I'm kind of skipping over a lot of points here, but like for four hours, we find no fish. There's just, there's nothing. And so around 11 o'clock, we're like, you know what? Let's break into those carnitas. <laughs> Let's eat some carnitas. And so we take, you know, a nice little some lunch siesta, a nice, little Mexican Coke, carnitas, maybe a beer, and, uh, and just kind of relax and, again, lick our wounds for a little bit, and this is a slow fishing day. And so uh, Nick starts talking about, like, let's let's kind of salvage the day. Let's He's like, we've got a new incoming tide. Let's go to a different little sand point and see if any bonefish are coming in. And so there is this kind of fresh wave of sargasso that comes in, and, um, and, and so we wade out and start to see some pairs of bonefish. And I don't know. Maybe the fresh tide hit them right, but these fish all of a sudden behaved like bonefish. <laughs> Throw it out, boom. Instant eat, they take off, beautiful bonefish run you see your backing reel them in and then they're yucatan bonefish they're they're pretty stocky so is it taking a photo every time it stutters no it's taking video oh okay i keep pressing the button is that wrong It was great. So we, we, you know, my brother and I, we, we notch a couple bonefish. Oh, was it easy? No, he's getting. He looked up for food. Look, look at the size of that permit. So we notch a couple bonefish. Kind of are salvaging the day around two o'clock. Um, start looking for some more and it kind of bleeds over into four o'clock and it's, it's about quitting time. 
And Nick goes, okay, hold on, hold on. I want to go to one grass flat before we go home just to show you some of the diversity we have here in the Yucatan. And we're like, okay, let's do that. And so we go there and we start waiting. And goodness, within 30 seconds, there's these big black sickles waving in the air. Permit. Good ones tailing in really skinny water. And so we start to wade out for these things. And there's, a, there's about a bunch, you know, about a dozen of them in a tight feeding group where they're tailing and I guess, you know, chasing crabs. Um, and so we take a couple shots at them and we're just being smart. We're being conservative, throwing really long casts ahead of them, seeing if they'll come out and rush it. They don't. Um, at one point, errant casts spook some of them and they run off about 100 yards and start milling around and feeding again. So we kind of start hunting them. I kind of crouched down and go after them and I'll never forget it. They, they bunched up and started tailing. And so I had the wind coming this way. And so I knew if I shot my line over the school, the wind would carry it over them and kind of put it right on the edge. And, it, and it's kind of, you know, a little bit of, of a, a gutsy call because if there's a fish that's hanging down, I'm going to spook it. But, you know, we hadn't notched one yet. So we, I knew we needed to get a little closer. So I shoot that cast. The wind does drift it. It lands about a foot outside of them. And I, I go strip, strip, and then immediately, bam, fish hits it. And I can see the tail take That's off as fine. soon as it feels the hook. And I was like, oh no, what happens next? And because again, this is a better permit, clears the line and just rips off the reel. Takes off, I mean, I can see it because it's on a shallow flat. I can see it kicking 200, 250 yards away, just doof, 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 doof. And so Nick runs over to me. I'm fighting it and I'm, I'm, I'm freaking out because I'm like, this is a permit not worth losing. So I'm like, how do I do this right? Oh no! <laughs> okay. Nick is like, hey, I need you to calm down, relax, let it run, keep constant pressure. But FYI, if you get this thing close, it may go for a longer run than the initial run. And I was like, that makes sense. That's not what bonefish do. But I don't say that out loud, but I just you know, keep on working, working, working. And he kid you not, the first run, it comes all the way in like a little puppy. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're going to tail this thing on the first run. And like Nick starts laughing at me because he can see that I like chilled out in my head. He's like, get ready. And as soon as it comes back and sees us, boom, it is gone. <laughs> Just hundreds and hundreds of yards running into my backing. So far that I feel like I need to hustle after it. And then like Nick's like, I think you have enough backing. Just I would change it. Yeah, look at my beard. Yeah, if he sees that, he's going to be out. I've been honestly thinking that all day. And so um, he clears all that way, come back, reel it in. Uh, I'm freaking out. I try to laugh with Nick and act like I'm having a good time, but I'm like dying inside freaking out. Beach, and, um, and then, you know, after a couple more runs, Nick grabs the tail, hands it over to me, and, it, and it's a quality permit. And it's, I mean, it's so cool, right? Like it, it was tailing, it was on foot. I mean, it, it's just like, it's crazy to think that in a day I'd walk down a bonefish and caught it in the surf. I'd walk down this permit um, over a turtle glass. Like again, we, we'd fish out of a pickup truck all day long. Like it's pretty cool, right, to do that. And so um, just like the day before, I'm excited, I'm high-fiving. <laughs> <laughs> it's about five o'clock so the sun is kind of waning and uh and nick bumps me and he goes well you gotta get that tarpon right and i was like oh my gosh forgot about the grand slam <laughs> i forgot that like this is what you're supposed to do and i was like well are there any like lagoons or lakes we can hit on the way in and he's like um maybe like let's let's give it a go and so, um, as we are uh, leaving the permit spot, we drive a couple miles, and um, I get a text from a couple of guys um, who had taken the day off, and they were just kind of taking a siesta all day, drinking margaritas, hanging out. And they were like, must be lame working so hard when the fish are at our house. And uh, I look at Nick, I was like, what, what fish could be you know, near our rental house? And he goes, 
I mean, if it's anything, it's going to be tarpon. And so Nick immediately, like, hits the pedal to the floor of his truck and just races through the Mexican backwoods, just tearing up the road. Because he's like, he's like, dude, we don't have time to put the John boat in the lagoon. Like, this is your best shot. And so um, by the time we get back, like, the sun is like, I mean, again, it's, it, the sun is set. It is not dark, but it's twilight. And so I kind of hang my head, and I'm like, you know, it is what it is. I'm not going to be a jerk and, like, try to run and claim my spot or whatever. I was like, I'm going to help, you know, get all the gear in from the day. And uh, as I start to gather the gear up, I hear the guys hollering. They're like, tarpon, tarpon, tarpon. And so uh, George runs out of the house, and he's like, dude, there's tarpon out here. You get your ass out here right now. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And I sprint through the house, and it's literally like chariots of fire. Like, I go, and George has a rod rigged up, because apparently he was going to go fish for himself, but he literally hands the baton of a fly rod to me. I grab it, I run out, slosh through the water, this rotten sargasso, it's right there on the beach, smells awful, but I, I kind of wade out about waist deep, and there's a circle of tarpon. I can see them kind of daisy chaining and rolling and rolling and rolling. And, um, you know, I realized that this was kind of a big deal, so I took two breaths, and I was like... Phew. Okay, they're right there. They're in a daisy chain, rolling in a circle, so it's about, you know, six feet wide. So let's put the fly about a foot off of that and drag the edge and see if we can't have anybody come out. I like to go a little short so I have time for redemption. So I cast two feet ahead of, the, of that daisy chain and uh, nothing. So I strip it in and I go, okay, I'm gonna have to put it on it. So I strip back, make the cast, land what I in with what is I think the daisy chain and the fly lands and nothing like there's no eruption so it's like okay good I didn't spook anything tick 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 and then I just see this golden flash and boom tarpon's on lean the rod to the side thing goes airborne it's a good little baby tarpon nothing you know of grand size but still like a decent tarpon hook it up and I think I'll look back at the camera because I'm like pale I'm like Oh my gosh, this is it. <laughs> like, this, this is it. Like, I'm about to catch a grand slam if I can, you know, not mess this up. Clear the line, reel it in. And yeah, with, with no light out, with nothing left in the day, caught a damn grand slam. Again, I, I, I mean, I would almost say, like, if I was telling this story to someone at a bar, they're like, I don't believe you. But the great thing is, like, we have the film clips. Like, it's all here. And so as, as I walk in, I'm like shaking my head and Nick actually runs out in the water <laughs> because he's like, you got a grand slam. Holy crap. You got a grand slam on foot, no lodge boat, no skiff, no nothing on foot, all waiting. You got a grand slam. And, um, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I legitimately couldn't believe it. And what's crazy about this grand slam is that like, it kind of fit my M.O. of fishing. Like, I love fishing on foot. I love waiting. I love kind of the pursuit of catch and release fishing. And it's kind of wild. Like, I guess I've been fly fishing for over 20 years. I never really tried to catch a Grand Slam, but it's just kind of weirdly cool and fitting that when I caught a Grand Slam, it was on foot and it was completely lucky.